Hello, my name is Bob Jarnigan. I'm the Jefferson County Historian, and today's Let's Chat is brought to you by Appalachian Electric Cooperative. Our landmark site today is Douglas Dam, and we'll be exploring the storied history of this landmark and how it fundamentally changed the trajectory of Jefferson County and East Tennessee in general. In my opinion, today's topic represents a set of historic events having one of the greatest impacts on the lives of the people of Jefferson County the arrival of the Tennessee Valley Authority, and the formation of AEC. The formation of the cooperative was a beautiful picture of how a group of people, farmers and those who lived in remote locations, came together for the greater good of their community to make life better and easier. It was a unification of the American people, of laborers, business people, and farmers rising up with a spirit of determination and hope. Franklin D. Roosevelt was inaugurated on March 4th, 1933, and he immediately initiated a series of New Deal programs in an attempt to lift the country out of several years of a deep depression. So many bills were presented to Congress that their names were shortened mostly to three letters, and TVA was one of the most unusual and enduring. Some of the earliest electric power in Jefferson County was being produced privately by individuals using generators powered by diesel engines or by cascading water to supply limited electricity to folks living in the more populated areas. Things were about to change. The 1940s represented the birth of something entirely new on September the 1st, 1940, Appalachian Electric Cooperative was established. The cooperative began with only 999 members and only five employees. It's almost impossible for most of us to understand just what an incredible difference it made to the lives of farmers and other rural folks when the lights came on. I remember when the ceiling, they put in ceiling lights and they just had the string. I remember that we didn't have to fill up the oil lamps anymore. <laughs> the first thing we got was a hot plate, and boy, that was just like heaven. We raced home to see who got to pull that string the first time, that piece of chain. Yes. And I think I won it. <laughs> there was an emphasis on helping homemakers take advantage of modern appliances. AEC assisted their members with finding helpful ways to use electricity in their homes and on their farms. Members would gather together to learn how to use their appliances. The people who did not have electricity wanted it, and the ones who did have electricity wanted it for more hours of the day and night. As early as 1936, there was a report to Congress that a TVA dam on the French Broad River should be constructed to provide for the complete and effective navigation and flood control on the Tennessee and Mississippi rivers, but construction of Douglas Dam was deferred because it would flood some of the best agricultural land in the area and impact a sizable canning industry. I think uh, different people had different opinions. Some of them was opposed to the building of the dam, and some of them, maybe it helped. My family thought that uh, it would probably be a good thing, and our, our property wasn't uh, impacted. World War II provided the needed justification. The nation required vast amounts of electricity to power the war effort publicly for the production of aluminum in Alcoa, but privately to fuel the secret city's Manhattan Project in Oak Ridge. Here we are now in the midst of what was once an active community called Oak Grove, situated along the banks of the French Broad River. Local citizens opposed the project, and they received support from Tennessee Senator Kenneth McKellar, chairman of the Appropriations Committee at TVA. Opponents of Douglas Dam, with the help of Senator McKellar, argued that the necessary power could be found elsewhere. On September 12, 1941, a map of the proposed Douglas Lake was printed in the Dandridge Banner with the headline, 
the dragon, which threatens the fertile French Broad Valley. Over here is the French Broad Baptist Church, which came close to also being taken by Douglas Lake, if not for the courage of one of their members, Francis Burnett Swan, who wrote poems and letters to senators, representatives, and even Eleanor Roosevelt, pleading with the government to save their historic church. And it worked. TVA built a dike around the church property, and the church was saved. The TVA had helped people a lot. They would have had no jobs or out of work and whatever. And so the, the TVA has been one good thing to help people. Well, most of my family supported it and all my neighbors that lived around because I, I always heard my dad and mom say during that time that a lot of their people would have probably about starved to death. We were in the Great Depression mm -hmm. at that time and it provided jobs. Construction on Douglas Dam began on February 2, 1942, and by June, more than 6,000 employees were on the payroll. The project was completed in one year and 17 days, a world record. The dam is 202 feet high and is 1,705 feet long. The cost of the project was $45 million, the lake is 43.1 miles long and has 555 miles of shoreline. The majority of the shoreline on Douglas is privately owned due to TVA's extensive use of flood easements instead of an outright purchase of land. The purpose of using flood easements was probably twofold. One being the speed with which TVA needed to move on this project and the other purpose being to help convince the residents who were resisting to give up their fight since they would still own their land. And as the lake receded during the fall and winter months, they could still use the land. My daddy's, I guess, stepbrother or half-brother, but he sat out there when the government officials come to him and uh, he sat out there with his shotgun and said they weren't taking his house. And this went on for probably, maybe even a month. And he finally gave it up and took their offer. Most people in Jefferson County with property along the French Broad River thought they would one day get their land back. The widespread use of flood easements on Douglas resulted in the unusual use of right of reversion clauses in future deeds. An example is found in a 1973 Jefferson County property deed for land on Douglas Lake, which ends with this statement. Provided that in the event Douglas Dam is destroyed or dismantled, the property below elevation 1007 shall revert to the party of the first part or their heirs and assigns. When I think about Douglas Dam, I have feelings about history lost and history made. Valuable river bottom farmlands, 525 families displaced, businesses, mills, stores, churches, schools, whole communities such as Oak Grove and Shady Grove forced to relocate as every building that was standing below the level of the new lake had to be moved or destroyed. Growing up in Dandridge, the lake has always been a thing of beauty and enjoyment for me. One time, me and my sister-in-law decided we wanted to walk over to where the water level was. And we got so full and marred up in the mud to our knees, so we had to leave and go home. Yeah. But it was just really something to see. Today, in addition to the important function of power generation, flood control, and navigation assistance, the lake has become a major draw for tourism, fishing, recreation, and for people relocating to Jefferson County. This is where we fished and played all of our life. And it was a big change. The building of Douglas Dam in the early 1940s to meet emergency energy demands at the height of World War II is still an integral part of our history. Without it, nothing we do to serve our members today would have been possible. As we think back about how far we've come over the decades, we couldn't have powered this community without our partnership with TVA and the construction 
of Douglas Dam. From myself, our friends at AEC, and the entire Project Let's Chat team, we thank you for your time and hope that you will join us at our next landmark.